Hello, my holy sisters and brothers. It's great to be with you on a Thursday. Happy Thanksgiving to all who are celebrating Thanksgiving. We have so much to be thankful for. I apologize. I said we'd be on at 3 o'clock. I was 10 minutes late. You know, I went to... uh, I, I use this app on my phone to run this camera so we go, we stream out to Facebook and YouTube simultaneously. And every now and then it has the firmware update. And it's been asking me that for the last few days. Do the firmware update. And I always say no because I want to do it after the show. And today by mistake I said yes. And then I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's like doing this firmware update while I'm trying to get on. Anyway, I apologize for being a few minutes late. Let's light up the darkness. All right, let me turn that off. Do not disturb. Special showtime, do not disturb. Okay, who is with us as we gather to do some beautiful learning on Thanksgiving Day? (coughs) Excuse me, Rose in New Mexico, Melissa in New York, Shandora in the Bronx, Francisco in California, John in Maine, Jose in Miami Lakes, Aoife in Florida, Bill in southeastern Missouri, bittersweet. Today we took our last leave from my childhood home. It's gone to a nice little old lady in a close family, two hours, but we will miss it all the same. I can imagine that 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 bittersweet feeling of saying seeing the family home go. But you know. Not every change is good, but everything good requires change. And may this be a good thing for you, Bill, and your family. Uh, Paula, happy Thanksgiving. Blessings from the great Northwest. Paul in Minneapolis. Heather in Kansas. Nina wishing everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Tom in Chicago. Gorda wishing us happy Thanksgiving. Over there on the YouTube side, Aoife posted on Facebook by mistake. And happy Thanksgiving on the YouTube side. Today's episode of AT Daily is sponsored by Christine Orich. Uh, and, who, and who's dedicating on behalf and, 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 and honor, her dedication is in honor of our AT community. What a beautiful dedication, Christine. It's so great to have you in our community. May you and all your loved ones be showered in blessings even more than your ample imagination could contemplate, even greater blessings than that. And we all say, Amen. All right, where are we holding? We are in Tractate Tinus, the 10th volume of the Talmud. We're still in chapter 1. Today's daf is Yud Gimel, page 13. Uh, we're in Mishnah, we're done doing the commentary, the Gemara's on Mishnah number 5 here in chapter 1. And we've been talking about fasts that are decreed in response to drought. The rain hasn't come. First, the prominent individuals in the community, the Torah scholars and students of Torah, would do individual fasts. If the rain still didn't come, the Sanhedrin, the court, would decree a communal fast. And that was a series of fasts. Monday, Thursday, Friday, I'm sorry, Monday, Thursday, Monday, daytime fast. If the rain came after those three fasts, great. If the rain did not come, they would start to decree additional fasts. In all, there would be 13 of these fast days that could be decreed, and they would be increasing in their severity, not just not eating and drinking during the day, but also not washing, not working, uh, you know, and, and taking on other kinds of mourning practices, heavier afflictions, uh, as we need as we need to examine our deeds 
right? At least the pe- the population in ancient Israel, where their behavior was so much more tied to whether God would send the blessing of rain or not. They were living at a higher spiritual level in ancient Israel, and if they and if they diminished from living at that high level, you know, then God would send them these warnings in the form of drought. Okay, so. Uh, these are the fasts that we're talking about. Now we pick it up at the bottom of the B side of page 12. And the Gemara asks, how do they act on a fast day? So far we've been talking about when the fast days were decreed, when was the rain late and coming, etc. Okay, so now it's a fast day and we know that we're going to be fasting, uh, you know, from sun up to sun down during these kinds of fasts. What other activities are going on? What else is happening during that fast day? So Abaye said, from the morning until the middle of the day, they examine the affairs of the town, right? So it's a town-specific fast. It could be that it's not a drought everywhere in the land of Israel. Some, in some parts of Israel, it's raining. In other parts, it's not. So it's a town-specific fast. That community has decreed, the court of that community, the sages of that community have decreed a fast on that community. So now that they're having this fast, from the morning until the middle of the day, according to Abaye, they examine the affairs of the town by checking if there are any deficiencies or corruptions in the city, moral or otherwise, and they attempt to fix them. I mean, imagine that very often we say, you know, the government in some particular place is corrupt. The people are acting corruptly. So imagine a drought came and everybody's afraid, you know, maybe we're all going to starve because we're really going to have problems. So let's examine our deeds and let's examine our deeds communally. Let's see how we're functioning as a society. If we are falling short, we need to make a change, not just point the finger and blame other people, but examining our deeds as a community, uh, as these problems may have been the cause of the divine punishment, the divine restraining of the rain. So from this point forward, after the middle of the day, for a quarter of the day, right? So half the day is gone. They spent it examining their deeds. Now we're in the afternoon. So for a quarter of the day, they read the portion from the Torah and a portion from the prophets, the Haft Torah. And from this point forward, they pray and they petition for mercy as it is stated. And they stood up in their place. <clears throat> this is from the book of Nehemiah or Nehemiah. 9 3 and they stood up in their place and they read in the book of the Torah of the Lord their God a fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and prostrated themselves before the Lord their God and the Gemara asks well I could reverse the order of events so that the first half of now we're at the top of 13a I could I can reverse the order of events so that the first half of the day is spent in prayer Well, the second half is focused on the concerns of the community. The Gemara answers, it should not enter your mind to say that, as it is written elsewhere. Then were assembled to me everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel due to the faithlessness of them of the captivity. And I sat appalled until the evening offering. That's Ezra, Ezra 9.4, the prophet Ezra is talking. And it is written in the next verse, and the meal, and at the meal offering, I arose from my fast, even with my garment and my mantle rent, meaning ripped, and I fell on my knees, and I spread out my hands to the Lord, says Ezra. And these verses indicate that first one must deal with the issues of the community, and only after engage in prayer during a fast day. New subject. Raphram Bar Papa said that Rav Chista said anything that is prohibited due to mourning. For example, bathing on the ninth of Av, mourning like a like a mourner, right? Some, somebody who is in mourning because of the death of a death. Uh, so anything that is prohibited because a person is in a state of mourning. For example, it's pro- it's prohibited to bathe on Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, when the whole Jewish people is in mourning for the destruction of the first and second temples, uh, or anything that is prohibited for a private mourner, 
is prohibited both in hot water and in cold water. And anything that is prohibited due to pleasure, for example, bathing on a communal fast, is prohibited in hot water but is permitted in cold water, provided that one washes for the sake of cleanliness. So here what the ruling is, is that it... What, you know, there are different kinds of fast days, right? Tisha B'Av, we're all fasting, commemorating the loss of the holy temples, and so we're in a state of mourning. When we're in a state of mourning, either because it's a Tisha B'Av and we're all mourning the loss of the temple, or because, God forbid, you lose a close relative, a close relative has died, you're going to be sitting Shiva for them, you are a mourner. So while you are a mourner, no bathing, not in hot water, not in cold water. During a communal fast, we're not in mourning. We're saying a drought is endangering our community. We're praying for rain. We're afflicting ourselves to show God that we're taking it seriously. We're examining our deeds and we're, you know, atoning and apologizing for whatever we've done that brought on this divine wrath. Uh, So we're fasting not, but we're not mourners. So on a day of fasting to, you know, kind of appease God and God's wrath, uh, so we don't want to engage in activities that are pleasant, that, that give us pleasure. So we don't bathe in hot water, which is something that is pleasing for a person. But just to be clean, we can wash ourselves in cold water. However, when we're in a state of mourning, we don't even wash in cold water. At least we don't bathe neither in hot water nor in cold water. When it's a, just a communal fast because of a drought, we could bathe in cold water but not in hot water. Uh, so Rav Edi Bar Avin said, we too learned this in the Mishnah. And, and, and the Mishnah said, and they lock the bathhouses. And this phrase indicates that only bathing in hot water is prohibited. Abaye said to Rav Edi Bar Avin, And if it were also prohibited to wash in cold water, should the Mishnah have taught they damn the rivers, right? You bathe in a river that's cold water. Are they going to say they damn the rivers in the same way that the Mishnah said they lock the bathhouses? It is impossible to damn the rivers. So it's impossible to stop people from bathing altogether, even though to sort of help them avoid making that mistake, we could lock the bathhouses. We can't fence all the sources of cold water that people could bathe in. So the statement of the Mishnah is not a sufficient proof that only bathing in hot water is prohibited. Perhaps bathing in cold water is also prohibited, but there's no way to prevent it. So Rav Shesha, the son of Rav Edi, said in explanation of his father's opinion, with regard to my father, the following poses a difficulty to his ruling. Since we already learned in the Mishnah that one is prohibited to engage in bathing, Why do I need the Tana, the sage of the Mishnah, to state they lock the bathhouses? We already know you're not allowed to bathe. So why do they also say they lock the bathhouses? Practically speaking, what does this clause add? Rather, isn't it correct to conclude from this that bathing is prohibited in hot water, but it's permitted in cold water during a communal fast due to a drought? And the Gemara proposes, let us say that the following Baraisa supports Rav Chista's ruling that it is prohibited for a mourner to bathe himself even in cold water. All who are obligated in immersions immerse themselves in their usual manner, both on Tisha B'Av and on Yom Kippur. What are these obligatory immersions? Well, we know that the high priest immerses a bunch of times on Yom Kippur, so he's obligated to immerse, and he does it on Yom Kippur. Okay, that's a special case. There's only one high priest, and he's serving on behalf of the nation. Who else would have an obligatory immersion? Well, when the temple is standing, uh, if you've come into contact with a dead body, so you have to go through a purification process, and on your seventh day, you would immerse, Uh, to complete your purification, and then you would be permitted to enter the Holy Temple. Are you obligated to immerse at that time? We'll discuss this, uh, you know, when we get to that subject in in greater detail later in our journey through the Talmud. 
Uh, but in ancient times, there were times when you had to, you, you were obligated to immerse so that you would not remain in a state of impurity any longer than was necessary. So you should immerse at the appropriate time. Nowadays, we don't have uh, immersions which are obligatory on a certain date, right? In fact, the only, ob the only immersions that we have these days uh, that are commanded would be a convert to Judaism, has to immerse at the time of the conversion. And women immerse, you know, once a month, married women immerse uh, who are having their menses, and then they count the clean days after their menses end. Then they immerse so that the husband and wife will be permitted to each other. But, you know, you don't have to do that on that day. You could wait another day. You don't have to do an immersion on Tisha B'Av or on Yom Kippur. It can wait since you can't have marital relations on that day anyway. Uh, what are the laws with respect to this? A mourner is prohibited both in hot water and in cold water. What is the halacha? A mourner may not bathe uh, his entire body, even in cold water. It is prohibited for him to wash his face, hands, and feet in hot water, but he may wash his hands, face, and feet in cold water during the days of his mourning. He can't immerse, he can't dip his whole body, even in cold water, but he could wash his hands, feet, and face. Uh, if he is extremely dirty, he is permitted to wash himself in the ordinary manner in accordance with the opinion of Rav Chist, as explained in the Gemara below. Some commentaries note that strictly speaking, these prohibitions apply only during the first seven days of mourning, the Shiva, although it is customary for mourners to refrain from bathing for 30 days. In places where this custom prevails, one should not deviate from it. Uh, with respect to obligatory immersions, if the day designated for one's ritual immersion occurs on the 9th of Av or on Yom Kippur, he is permitted to immerse himself on that day. Nowadays, however, there is no obligation to immerse on a precise date, and therefore one may not immerse himself on Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of Av, or on Yom Kippur. Uh, isn't the, now so so with respect to this idea of is the Mishnah talking about hot water and cold water? It, rather, isn't the Baraisa referring to cold water? And it teaches that those obligated in immersions, yes, they are permitted to use cold water. But another person who is not obligated to immerse, no, he may not wash even in cold water. And Rav Khan of Arkatina said, this is no proof, as the ruling of the Baraisa was necessary only for the hot springs of Tiberias, which are warm without having been drawn and in which it is possible to immerse. Right? You can immerse in the hot springs of Tiberias. Can you do your immersion in hot water if you are scheduled to do that immersion and that's the only place to immerse? It would seem that yes, you could, but not nowadays. The Gemara objects, if so, say the latter clause of the same Mishnah that Rabbi Hanina, the deputy high priest, said, the mourning for the house of our God, meaning mourning for the loss of the temple, Tisha B'Av, uh, is worthy of the loss of a ritual immersion once a year, right? So, okay, you were scheduled to have your immersion because that's the end of your purification process because you came into contact with the corpse. It fell on Tisha B'Av, Okay, now we're saying it's permitted for you to immerse on that day, but why? Why not just have you wait another day? I mean, isn't it worth it to say no immersions, even obligatory immersions on Tisha B'Av, since we're all involved in the heavy process of mourning for the loss of the temple? And if you say that it is permitted to immerse in cold water, why does Rabbi Hanina, the deputy high priest, say that he loses his immersion? Let him bathe in cold water without having to neglect his immersion or transgress the prohibitions of a fast day. And Rav Papa said, it could be argued that the Barais is referring to a place where cold water is not available, but only hot springs. In this case, there is no choice but to wait until the following day to immerse. So if your immersion, your obligatory immersion when the temple is standing happens to fall on Tisha B'Av, well, if the temple is standing, then, we're, then Tisha B'Av has actually become a day of celebration, is no longer a day of mourning. But at any rate, uh, you know, 
I'm not, I'm not even sure how to handle that. We're going to move on. We skip a few paragraphs. Uh, come in here a statement of a Baraisa. As Rabbi Abba the priest said in the name of Rabbi Yosei the priest, an incident occurred in which the sons of Rabbi Yosei, the son of Rabbi Hanina, died. He lost multiple sons. And he bathed in cold water all seven days of mourning. This would seem to contradict our understanding that a mourner doesn't immerse his whole body, neither in hot water nor, in, nor even in cold water. But here, Rabbi Yosei, who lost several sons, did immerse in cold water during all seven days of the Shiva. Why? The Gemara rejects this argument. There, it was a case where his mourning periods came one after the other as his sons died in quick succession. So we can't learn from the fact that Rabbi Yose bathed in cold water during his seven days as a mourner because it wasn't just seven days. His sons died in quick succession. So maybe he had, you know, 14 days or maybe there was three sons and it was 21 days and there was just like all this mourning time and he had to bathe just to get clean. He certainly wasn't bathing for, for pleasure. So we don't have a proof that just because he bathed while he was a mourner that, that mourners are allowed. In fact, mourners are not allowed to bathe neither in hot water nor in cold water. They can only wash their hands, feet, and face. If one's mourning periods immediately succeeded each other and his hair grew heavy, his hair grew filthy, then even though it is generally prohibited for a mourner to cut his hair, he may lighten it with a razor. He can, you know, not with scissors, but he can cut some of his hair off with a razor. And he may likewise wash his garments in water only because he had successive periods of mourning one after another. And so just for the sake of decency, he can, you know, cut off some of his hair and wash his garments, which normally would not be allowed for the mourner if it's just one mourning period. With regards to this, Baraisa Rav Hista said, one who is obligated to observe periods of mourning in quick succession may trim his hair with a razor, but not in the normal manner with scissors. Likewise, he may, he may wash his garment in water, but not with natron, a type of soap, nor with sand. His clothes are getting filthy. He doesn't have a lot of other clothes he can dress in. So, okay, he can rinse out his clothes, but he can't launder them in the regular fashion. So for the, sakes, for the sake of human uh, dignity, they're going to allow you to cut some of your hair, to wash your clothes, but not in the normal manner so that you stay in that period of mourning. We're on the B side of page 13. We skip a few paragraphs. Some say a different version of the debate that we've been hearing. Rava said it is prohibited for a mourner to bathe in cold water all seven days of mourning. Mara asks, in what way is this case different from eating meat and drinking wine, which a mourner is permitted to do? If the mourner has to afflict himself while he's a mourner, and that's why he can't bathe at all, well, why is he allowed to eat, drink, eat meat and drink wine, which are associated with celebration? Why is he allowed to eat those foods while he is a mourner? And the Gemara responds, there, he acts to relieve his anxieties. Since a mourner is typically distressed over the death of a close relative, the sages permitted him to fortify himself with strong food and drink. He's not celebrating when he's eating meat and drinking wine while he's a mourner. He's just replenishing his energy. And the Gemara proposes, let's say... Uh, that the following Baraisa, let's say that the following Baraisa supports Rava's ruling. A grown woman is not permitted to render herself unattractive during the days of mourning for her father. As above, the Gemara infers that this law applies only to a grown woman. But a young woman who is not of marriage age is permitted to render herself unattractive. Now, why are they talking about this woman can't render herself unattractive while she's a mourner? It's actually a leniency for her, right? Because she is a single woman who stands to be married and wants to, you know, keep her, 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 her appearance pretty attractive. 
because she's now in that in that period of time when she, you know she's looking for a husband and a husband is looking for her uh, and you know she shouldn't just let her hair grow wild and everything and be rendered unattractive. It also means that she doesn't have to obey these real difficult stringencies of the mourner, you know, no bathing at all, letting the hair grow, letting the nails grow, just like, you know, let, letting yourself really go to seed, as it were, uh, as an act of, um, you know, of, 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 of uh, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, of deference to the, the law, to the dead, to the departed, right? It's really honoring the departed by just wallowing in your, in, in your distress, in your sadness as you're mourning for them. Uh, but this young single woman who, is, who has reached the age of marriage uh, doesn't have to render herself unattractive during the mourning period. So in what kind of water may a grown woman bathe? If we say that this is referring to hot water, well, is a grown woman not permitted to refrain from washing in hot water? But didn't Rav Chista say it is prohibited for a mourner to insert even his finger into hot water for the purpose of washing? Rather, is it not the case that the Bryce is referring to bathing in cold water? That this woman who, you know, she's, she's going to be allowed to do a little bit more during the mourning period than a man would be able to do. He can't bathe even in cold water, but perhaps she can bathe in cold water. And the Gemara answers, no, the Brisa is speaking of painting the eyes and dyeing the hair. She also can't bathe even in cold water. She could wash her hands, face and feet. And so that she won't render herself too unattractive during that period, she could paint her eyes and dye her hair, which a man would not be allowed to do, but the woman is allowed. And Rachista said, that is to say, i.e., as the Brisa states that it is permitted for a grown woman who observes successive periods of mourning to paint and dye her hair, the same law evidently applies to laundry, from which it may be inferred that in an unexceptional case, just one period of mourning, not you, somebody had the tr terrible misfortune of losing two relatives uh, one after the other, and so the mourning is extended many days, but rather just one relative was lost, so this person is an unexceptional case. It is prohibited for a mourner to wash laundry all seven days of the shiva, all seven days of the initial mourning. And the Gemara concludes, and the practical halacha is, the law is, it is prohibited for a mourner to bathe his entire body, both in hot water and in cold water, all seven days of mourning. However, with regard to his face, his hands, and his feet, although it is pro prohibited to bathe them in hot water, in cold water, it is permitted. However, with regard to smearing with oil, anointing the skin with oil, even any minimal amount of smearing is prohibited, but if one does so to remove dirt, it is permitted, but not you know, to sort of make yourself feel good, right? Anointing for the purpose of pleasure is prohibited during mourning. What is the halakha? Uh, after the deceased is buried, the mourner is permitted to eat meat and drink a small amount of wine during his meal. However, he should not drink heavily. There's no drinking at the shiva like to get drunk, not for the mourners. Uh, during the seven-day period of mourning, it is prohibited for a mourner to launder his clothes, both during the day and at night, in accordance with the opinion of Rachista. And during the seven-day period of mourning, it is prohibited for a mourner to smear any of his body with oil if he does so for pleasure. However, it is permitted to smear oil to remove dirt or for a medicinal purpose. New subject, and I'm almost done. Just the last few paragraphs that we're going to read together. So if you've got questions or comments, please get them in now. So the Gemara returns to the discussion of the Anenu prayer, which is recited on fast days. So what is the Anenu prayer? We've mentioned this a few times, that when we're having a fast day, even today, uh, like a full fast day, like Tisha B'Av, or minor fasts, like Som Gedalia, or, or, or uh, Tainus Esther, uh, so for these fast days, we insert a special prayer into the daily prayer of the day, into the Amidah, the Shemona Esrei. Uh, what is the Anenu prayer? So we say, and now we're going to discuss when we would insert this, but what is the prayer itself? Anenu Hashem Anenu. Answer us, O Lord, answer us on our fast day, for we are in great distress 
Do not turn to our wickedness. Do not conceal your face from us. And do not disregard our supplications. Be near to our cry. Let your loving kindness console us. Answer us even before we call to you. As it is said, and it shall be that before they call, I will answer. I, the Lord, will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. For you, Lord, are he who answers in times of distress, who redeems and rescues in all times of distress and tribulation. Blessed are you, Lord, who answers his people, Israel, in time of distress. So as you can see, it's an additional blessing that is added to the Shemona Esrei. It ends in, blessed are you, Lord, who answers his people in time of distress. So it's an additional blessing at the end of that paragraph that is getting added to the daily prayer that we say three times a day. Okay, so uh, the prayer of a fast. How does one mention it? Rav Yehuda granted his son, Rav Yitzhak, general permission to expound publicly while instructing him in the substance of what he should say. And Rav Yitzhak taught, an individual who took a fast upon himself prays the prayer of a fast. So not only during communal fast days do we add the anenu, but an individual who took on a fast, who obligated himself in a fast, adds that anenu prayer to his amidah. Uh, and where in the amidah does he recite the additional prayer? Between the seventh blessing of the amidah, blessed are you who redeems his people Israel, and the eighth blessing, blessed are you, Lord, who heals his people. Right. So redeems, that one ends, blessed are you, Lord, redeemer of Israel, and who heals, blessed are you, who, uh, blessed are you, Lord, who heals the sick of his people, Israel. And so you insert the Anenu prayer between those two blessings. And that indeed is where the Anenu sits, where it has, you know, been adopted into our prayer books. Rav Yitzhak strongly objects to this. But may an individual establish a blessing for himself in addition to the fixed blessings of the Amidah? So Rav Yitzhak is saying, well, that might be the place in the Amidah where you put it, but a person who undertook a voluntary fast, not an obligated fast, why would he have the privilege or the right uh, to in add an extra blessing to the Amidah, the liturgy of which is fixed by the sages? How can an individual just go in and add another blessing? Rather, Rav Yitzhak said, one mentions his fast in the blessing who listens to prayer, right? So that's uh, the penultimate blessing of the 18 blessings uh, where we say, hear our voice, Lord, our God, merciful Father, have compassion upon us and accept our prayers in mercy and favor for you are a God who hears prayers and supplications. Do not turn us away empty-handed from you, our King, for you hear the prayer of everyone. Blessed are you, Lord, who hears prayer. So Rav Yitzhak says during that paragraph, before you get to the final blessing, blessed are you, Lord, who hears prayer, there you would mention, I am fasting. Please, you know, hear my prayers today on this day of fast. But you wouldn't add an additional blessing, says Rav Yitzhak. Uh, bah, 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 bah. and Rav Yitzhak said you add your you mention your fast in the blessing who listens to prayer in accordance with the general principle that an individual may insert private requests in this general plea for the acceptance of prayers including matters outside the scope of the established blessings that's the place in the Amidah where you add your personal prayers and similarly, Rav Shesha said, one recites a prayer for a fast day in the blessing, the one who listens to prayer. The Gemara raises an objection from a Baraisa. The only halakhic difference between an individual and a community is that this one, an individual, prays 18 blessings in his Amida, and that one, a community, prays 19 blessings. Now the Gemara analyzes this statement. What is an individual and what is a community in this context? If we say that an individual means an actual individual and a community is referring to the communal prayer leader, are there really only 19 blessings in the communal amidah of a fast? 
The prayer leader recites 24 blessings. As will be explained, there are six additional blessings that are added on communal fast days. Rather, is it not the case that this is what the Barais is saying? The only halakhic difference between an individual who took an individual fast upon himself and an individual who took a communal fast upon himself is only that this one prays 18 blessings <clears throat> as he mentions his fast in the blessing who listens to pray, the one who listens to prayer. And that one who undertakes to join a communal fast day, he prays 19 blessings because he adds the inane new blessing, the special fast day blessing, and learn from this statement that an individual may establish an individual blessing for himself. Uh, Rashi notes that the, uh, and this is the last thing I'm going to read, then I'm going to read questions and comments. Rashi notes that the Amidah prayer, that, that the Amidah prayer, the main element of the daily service, is also called the Shmona Esrei, meaning 18, despite the fact that it consists of 19 blessings, right? Every uh, Amidah has 19 blessings in it, every daily Amidah, even though it's called the 18 blessings. Why? Because after the temple was destroyed, the sages added an additional blessing against heretics, that God should punish the heretics. The 19th blessing against heretics was added at a later stage by Shmuel HaKatan. Other commentaries discuss the issue at length, and they point out that Shmuel HaKatan added the blessing against heretics in the period soon after the destruction of the Second Temple. Consequently, later Tanaitic sources, sages of the Mishnaic period, would be expected to reflect the fact that the daily Amidah is comprised of 19 blessings. Based on the Tosefta and the Jerusalem Talmud, the Rid argues that according to the original cost, custom observed in the land of Israel, the Amidah consisted of only 18 blessings, even after the addition of the blessing against the heretics, as the request for the reestablishment of the Davidic kingdom and the prayer for the rebuilding of Jerusalem were originally incorporated into a single blessing. So this is a long way of saying that, well, the Anenu prayer, when it's added on a fast day, brings our tally of blessings from 19 to 20. Okay. Let's go to questions and comments if there are any. Uh, that is loading. While that's loading, I'll mention uh, tomorrow is Friday. So I we'll be having this class at noon, the regular Friday time, as we get ready for Shabbos. This is, we're getting into the earliest Shabbos of the year. Uh, and also, I'll mention we're in our annual campaign. Uh, so right now, we really uh, are counting on everybody's support to make our budget for the coming year so that we can keep sharing Torah uh, with the world as we do and all the different formats in which we share it. And also, a special year for Accidental Talmudist, that we, next year we want to build an app so that we're not so reliant on the algorithms of Facebook and YouTube to reach our own audience. By the way, if you're listening to this, for now, it's on Facebook and YouTube Live. Make sure that you set uh, you know, your Facebook to notify you when we go live and to see our posts first. You can do that on our page. There's a menu there called Following and drop down menu and make, you know, add to favorites or make favorite or see first, whatever the language is in your particular expression of the Facebook app right now. Uh, but we want to get to a place where we have built an app that's just your own app on your phone. And you're going to see all kinds of content from us and it won't be so random when it appears. It's all going to be there and available waiting for you. And when we go live, you'll get notified. It'll be a much, much better way. And we're even talking about, uh, you know, bringing some other rabbis uh, and great speakers and teachers uh, to be part of our platform. That's that's plans further down the road. Uh, but we really want to, you know, be a platform that brings all kinds of beautiful Torah content to our community and isn't being throttled up and down by algorithms which are not particularly faith friendly, shall we say. Okay. Uh, so please donate. Donate.accidentaltalmudis.org. Okay, Bill. 
So if the exemption for the young single woman is a leniency, does that mean that a young single woman who chooses to go through the entirety of the mourning process, she is permitted? For that matter, is a young married woman allowed and or obligated to observe the fullness of mourning going to seed and all, presumably with the support of her husband, since I know the sages would be concerned that it could destabilize the peace of the household between them without that. I mean, you've exactly named all the relevant issues, Bill. You're you're definitely showing your very keen understanding of what's going on here. I mean, it's interesting because it does seem to say that, um, okay, what is the law? A grown woman is not permitted. It is permitted for a grown woman to paint her eyes and dye her hair when she is in mourning, including the first seven days of mourning. However, it is prohibited for a young woman to do so. So that's with regard right, to to keeping up her appearance by dyeing the hair and painting the eyes. So the grown woman, right, who is looking for the husband, as it were, uh, she's permitted. The young woman is not, is not permitted. She's prohibited. She must observe all the strictures of the mourning period. So it, all it says is a grown woman. I've been sharing this assumption because I heard, uh, I, I listened to this stuff being taught by Rav Gav, Rabbi Gavriel, as I was driving home today. Um, and he was talking about the, you know, the eligible woman. And I think that's a big part of it. But your question is very good. So, well, she's already got a husband, and if with the support of her husband, so it's not going to be a question of shalom bias, right, that, 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 you know, they're they're going to be repulsive to each other, Uh, is she permitted to, you know, not paint and dye herself? And it seems correct. She can observe the full mourning because it doesn't say she's obligated to keep up her appearance. It's just she's permitted to keep up her appearance. But the young woman you know, who is, who is not uh, at that stage yet. She neither has a husband nor is looking for a husband. So she's just fully obligated in the, in the stringencies of the mourning period. And finally, Paula, so you may wash using oil spir- sparingly. May have heard wrong cooking. Uh, no, it seems like, right, that you could use oil sparingly for the purpose of cleaning your skin. I mean, it, it, it like... It's hard for us to picture the whole ancient world because we're, we're just, you know, when we want to bathe, we just go to the bathroom and turn on the shower or run the bathtub. It's so easy. But in the ancient world, no, not so easy to take a bath. You know, I mean, if, if you lived in a place where there was a nice warm spring, okay, pretty easy. Uh, but for most people in most parts of the world, very difficult to take a warm bath. The only place where it was really available was at the bathhouse, if you could afford it and if your town had it. So then you could go, have a schwitz, you know, you you could go to the bathhouse and get clean. But, you know, and so now you could really see how well going to the bathhouse, that's not something we're going to do on a day of mourning or even a day of afflicting ourselves because we're examining our behavior, Uh, you know. Washing our hands, feet, our hands and feet and face, you know, in a basin of water. Okay, but you know, even sometimes that's not easy to do. But you know, you're you're just really dirty, so you could take some oil, kind of loosen the clods of dirt with the oil, then maybe take a rag and just get that dirt off yourself. You know, not what we would consider clean, but cleaner than the person was before, and so the sages permitted that even during mourning, but sparingly. Okay, that's what I've got for us today. May you be blessed uh, to to really count your blessings today on Thanksgiving for those who are celebrating Thanksgiving. We all have a lot to be thankful for and truthfully, you know, feel having that attitude of gratitude. Let's not wait for a day called Thanksgiving to feel that. Uh, You know, every day in our prayers, we say hodu, right? Let us give thanks to God. And it's a nice pun because the word hodu means turkey (laughs) in Hebrew. It's an amazing thing. So that it worked out that way. Uh, So, you know, every day is a day of Thanksgiving and especially with Shabbos approaching and next week Hanukkah approaching, which is all about giving thanks for all the blessings in our lives. Have a terrific evening. And with God's help, we'll be together again tomorrow for page 14 of Tractate Tinus at our regular Friday time, noon Pacific.